He is someone who will seem familiar to many of you, as he was a face we all got to know during the very complicated, difficult, and heart-wrenching trial of Jordan Davis's murder. So please welcome John Phillips as he shares his talk, America's Greatest Enemy, the Unevolving Virus of Prejudice. John Phillips. Good morning. Good morning. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. With those words, July 4th, 1776, we had some brave men that decided to be different. Get rid of the class system. Come out where we can pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But did you know, two days before, they made a slight change. The original text was, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable that all men are created equal. And scholars debate why they did that, whether it was to take some of the passion out of it, whether it was to make it a mathematical equation, but they did it. There it is. Four score and seven years later, Lincoln stood on a burial ground. What was to be a burial ground? It was a civil war ground. Battles were fought. Men died. And he said he was dedicated to the proposition. They were dedicated back then to the proposition that all men were created equal. Proposition. Hadn't quite gotten there yet. And he said the main thing we need to do is have a rebirth of the nation to make sure that we're fulfilling that prophecy. I'm going to introduce you to somebody else. There's a new book. We're going to pretend that one doesn't exist for purposes of today. <laughs> I still like the old book, To Kill a Mockingbird, and Atticus Finch. Looking at her dad from the sake, look, a child looking at her dad for the sake of who he was. A civil rights lawyer. So, you know, I kind of like that about him. And he spoke to Scout in this chair and in the book about equality. And about, it's not about walking a mile in somebody's shoes. It's about getting into their skin. Scout, you'll, you'll learn to get along better with people if you crawl in their skin and walk around a bit. Soak that up. My grandfather and great grandfather were good men. And my mom used to tell me, like I was scout about the deeds that they did. They didn't take cash for every transaction in 1930s, 1940s Mississippi. They took what people could give them and went into homes where sometimes they should. And I invite you to close your eyes. Picture the darkest place you can imagine. 1930s Mississippi. No street light, no hum of vehicles. Simple. Dirt roads. You're laying in bed. You feel proud, prideful for what you did that day. You helped people. Society said maybe you shouldn't have helped, but you helped them. There's a thing called a night raid, and that was when the Ku Klux Klan came in on horseback, snatched people out of their homes, and tortured them. So that pride that was in your heart if you heard those horse hooves, turned into great, great fear. Is that equality? Our law enforcement in the 1950s and 60s and 70s used dogs and hoses to enforce law. Was that equality? Is that sacred and undeniable? Fast forward to today. The law of the land is now everyone can get married. Marriage equality. In this very town, we don't have a human rights ordinance. 
Is that a quality? Is that sacred and undeniable? Is it even self-evident? Stand your ground allows people to kill over subjective fear. Outside of them. Is that a quality? Tim Harris, what he and his family have gone through, is that a quality? So we go back to, to my journey, and I, I don't like this picture of me. We all have a worse picture, and it's not that it's so bad, or not that I'm carrying the, you know, the 1990s vintage cordless phone. It's the flag in the back. And there's you know, the saying that everybody knows about the glass half full and the glass half empty. And my mother raised me right. And I wasn't prejudiced, and I wasn't biased that I knew. But I was focused on the glass that's half, the glass, excuse me, the glass that's half full. The part that said, we're, we're coming together, we're getting better as a nation. I didn't think about the glass that's half empty. I was in a white fraternity across the street from a black fraternity. I was, um, I walked every day past the plaque where, where Vivian Malone had to force herself to the National Guard in that school. I didn't focus on the rights that were still withhold, withheld. I focused on the rights that I thought they had. Everything changed for me in 2011. My mother, my greatest friend, passed away. She had one thing that she said to me over and over again, besides my grandfather's regret and life is good and love others, it was that you'd never know love until you held your own child in your hands. And she was right. Three months later, my first son was born. And it bore her name and my grandfather's names. Ten months later, I got a telephone call. I'd been watching the news. I had seen what happened on the south side of the Bay Meadows, that a young boy had been shot and killed. And they had no idea who killed him. And I got a phone call from a friend. He said, I need you to talk to a friend of mine. His son had been murdered. I said, what? What, what can I do? I, I'm, I'm just a lawyer. I, I, don't, I don't know how to help here. He said, just sit in the living room with and having just understood love and loss of my own, I sat with that family with Jordan Davis. Jordan Russell Davis. And as I sat with the Davis family and a mother who had just lost her only child, I realized that we were in deep, deep trouble. And I realized because of the birth of my son that I needed to make this world better, even if it was just one case, even if it was just one person. Briefly, for those of you that don't know the story of Jordan Davis, Jordan and his friends had been girl shopping. That's what they called it. At Town Center on Black Friday. They left, went to the gas station. Michael Dunn pulled up in the parking spot next to them. Like any teenager, they were listening to loud music. Like any teenager, they may have talked back when Michael Dunn came and said, hey, turn the music on. Turn the music on. Michael Dunn, 40-something-year-old white male, lived on the ocean, had an airplane, is the kind of guy we'd all probably ask if he needed a ride if he was broken down by the side of the street. Jordan Davis may not have looked like that same kid. He may not have been the guy that you... In fact, if Jordan Davis walked across the thought of the room, there's a piece of the brain called the amygdala. Your amygdala might, without you even thinking about it, nobody's going to raise their hand and say they're closed-minded. It's not like that. But your amygdala might have made you lock the car door because of where we've come over the last several years and how we haven't really been. Michael Dunn's last words to Jordan Davis were, you're not going to talk to me like that. He reached into his glove box, which I like to call a gun box here in Florida, fired three shots into Jordan's door. One, two, three. 
Fired three more shots as the vehicle was backing out. Four, five, six. That wasn't enough. As the vehicle went down the street, Michael Dunn got out of his vehicle, took a shooter stance, fired four more shots. First two shots killed Jordan Davis within minutes. And here I sat with his parents. They immediately started a, even though Michael Dunn never called the police, he went back to the hotel, faced himself a bowl of drink. Never cared. Drove home the next day. Never called the police. I had my chance to crawl around in the skin of this family. The family that had grown with the glass half into, they, they had understood the plight that I didn't understand. I was posting the glass that's half full, the white privilege. A phrase that I didn't even like, uttered, didn't understand. And I marched, and I walked, and I got refused for dinner, and I saw things that I generally denied existed, whether because I denied they existed or I didn't want to believe they existed in this country that I'd always been taught was fair. And I learned more from Lucia and Ron than I had in 12 years of practice. And ultimately a trial came. And at that trial, the jury was focused on the relative benefit of the doubt and weighing whether the fear that Michael Dunn experienced was reasonable or not. It didn't reach a verdict on whether or not to convict Dunn for the murder of Jordan Davis. They agreed that him getting out and getting his shooting stands was attempted murder. And so, in between trials, we refocused on the benefit of the doubt. The prosecutors, instead, in the second trial, focused on Jordan's little pom-pom hat and said, Burton. They tried to de Jordan Davis, because that's what we have to do in justice. They tried to show that Michael Dunn wasn't this guy that we all want to be. He was recluse, because that's what we have to do to get justice. One more thing about that first trial. And imagine going home to your wife to tell her this news. Got a death threat today. In fact, somebody said that we probably need to have cash in the safe in case Bennett gets inducted. That happened. In fact, I was told I wouldn't make it to the end of that trial. We had armed security to walk us in every day. This jacket that I'm wearing is made of Kevlar. It's bulletproof. Not that I fear anybody in here. I think we got a pretty safe crowd. But it'll stop at 357, it'll stop at 45. We proceeded to the second trial. Before the second trial, we talked about the benefit of the doubt. The car doors. The, the, what you would do if somebody drove by. Right before closing argument, I was sitting in the courthouse. I got my cell phone ready. It was time for my second son to be born. Right before that, I had a talk with Ron Davis. Ron, having lived in a life where the glass wasn't even just half empty, it was three quarters empty related to justice, was pretty resigned to the fact that justice may not come for his son. <coughs> and I hugged my new friend. And I said, Ron, in, this, in a world where my son is about to be born. Your son has equal standing and will get equal justice. I promise you that. It was a promise I couldn't fulfill. It was up to 12 jurors. But it was a promise that I knew in my heart. I went to the hospital where Weston was born. Listening to the closing arguments, literally up to the point of delivery, and then I put it down. <laughs> Thank you, Angie. And... Then, the next day, back in the courthouse, I had this feeling that I had to be there by 3 o'clock. I don't believe in premonitions. I don't believe in people whispering, you know, but I had a whisper. Get there by 3 o'clock. A little bit after that, Michael Thomas convicted me of 
the market in our days. First degree murder. Set it in that. Is that justice? It's a start. It's a start. But I can't tell you how many phone calls I get here in the middle of the night from somebody that's been pulled over for the wrong reasons. I can't tell you about the other victims. It would, it would take, it would, they, Sabine would get me off the stage. <laughs> but I can tell you that we can all make a little bit of difference. We can all be a little bit open-minded. That machine that we're dealing with is a machine of the brain and of the heart that we've all been just ingrained with, watching TV, listening to the news. We don't need to live in a world where we even have civil rights lawyers. We need to live in a world where civil rights lawyers don't need bulletproof jackets. Find out what your bulletproof jacket is. Find out what your fear is. And I tell you, you can defeat it. I promise you, you can defeat it. Ron Davis, business, up in the hospital the next day. My new best friend, challenge yourself. Be like Tim says, hug more people, love more people. We can have a better country. Thank you.